Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. So welcome everybody to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and I'm really delighted to have Emily Weiner here with us today from the International Well Building Institute. And Emily works on the standard development team at Well at the International App. It's also called IWBI. Yes. And uh, her focus is on the intersection of the built environment and public health. So, Emily, maybe you could just elucidate that whole idea, the built environment and public health, and tell us what is the mission of IWBI? So thank you for having me. First of all, Mira, I'm really pleased to be on the show and tell you more about IWBI. So IWBI's mission is to look at the spaces where people spend their time, which is primar primarily buildings, um, and see how they can shape your well-being every day. We know that people spend about 90% of their time indoors, which is really shocking, but when you think about your day, we really do spend most of our time either in our home, in our workplace, in our car, in a restaurant, it's all indoor spaces. So we know through years of research that, and research that increasingly comes out that these spaces really make a difference in how we feel and our long-term and short-term health. And so IWBI's goal is really to look at these components that shape health, break them down into different solutions that buildings can implement, and um, hopefully make a difference in how people who are in those spaces feel every day. So what kinds of organizations and buildings are you talking about? Are we talking about residential, commercial? Where, where are we going with this? So uh, well started really for commercial real estate spaces, offices, um, your classic sort of office worker uh, employee population. Um, as we've grown, and we're at about 1,600 projects now in 50 countries, so it's really exciting wow. to have seen it grow. I've, I've been at the organization for about three years, and it's really just going up, so it's, it's been remarkable. Um, we're seeing more and more different types of buildings and moving outside of our traditional office worker population and moving more into hospitals and healthcare and looking at the different dimensions that affect uh, a patient or a nurse or a doctor who's in that space. We also have some projects that are warehouses. So that's a very different type of work than sitting at your desk all day. You're more manual. And so it could lend itself to sort of different issues in terms of your health. Uh, we're also seeing schools and senior living um, and among others, airports. There's quite a, a diversity of the types of spaces we're seeing, which is really exciting and presents scale. Yes. From small to very, very grandiose. Right. I mean, if you think about an airport, what an yeah. enormous space, and the, it's, you're facing different issues. And so one of the challenges that my team faces, because I'm on the standard development team, is to adapt this um, system that we really developed initially for offices and an office worker to all these different types of spaces in lots of different places um, and lots of different types of people. So it's always fascinating and ever changing. Um, but yeah, so really uh, well is meant to be for everyone and every building and every space. And that's the direction we're moving in. And um, it's, it's been exciting to see it grow. So there are a bunch of different kinds of building certifications out there. There's LEED certification, for example, and other green kinds of rating systems. What makes well different? Um, we get that question a lot. And, and you know what, actually, let me back up because I don't think we said that there's actually a certification. There's a whole big process that people, organizations, yes. buildings can go through to get certified. Yes, yeah. Why don't I, I'll back, back up for a second and explain a little bit more about well certification so, and the different dimensions that we look at. 
So, well, uh, like those of you who are familiar with LEED or um, Green Star in Australia or BRIAM, which is more popular in Europe, uh, well is a certification system and our, our projects uh, have to meet certain requirements. And we look at requirements through what we call concepts, 10 different dimensions that impact human health and well-being, um, which includes looking at air quality, water quality, um, nourishment, so the types of food offerings that are, are presented in a workspace or, or in any other type of space. Um, we look at light, so access to natural light, as well as the specific types of lighting fixtures that you can install in a building to uh, reduce eye strain and headaches and things like that, and more uh, adequately align with your body's natural circadian rhythm. Um, if, if anyone's been in a fluorescent lit office, uh, you know how much that can really affect your mood and your, your sleep later in the day. And, and it's really fascinating to see the lighting industry shift to um, better align with how people evolved. Uh, we also look at acoustics. So if you've been in an open office, there's you know, noise is one of the biggest complaints that we hear. And yeah. there's different solutions you can make um, in the types of materials you pick in a building that uh, really support a, a more acoustically comfortable environment. We also look at movement. So there's different strategies that can um, help people just be a little more active throughout the day. And, and we don't necessarily always mean you have to go out and and run five miles to be healthy. But what a lot of emerging public health research has found is that it's these little tiny bouts of exercise throughout the day that can add up to help people be healthier. And so that can even just be taking the stairs every time you, when you leave the office and when you come back with your lunch um, and uh, having a sit stand desk and being able to you know, alternate between sitting and standing throughout the day, which is really good for your, your physical health. So um, these tiny little nudges really that help people be a little bit healthier throughout the day. Um, we also look at materials. So the physical materials that make up a building and also making sure that in some of our older buildings, there aren't harmful materials like asbestos and formaldehyde and all these older uh, materials that were found in older buildings that uh, can really cause some serious health issues. Uh, let's see, doing this off the top of my head. So you're doing amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I've rattled it off many times. <laughs> okay, let's see. Am I missing anything? I am. Although, missing you know, the thing that interests me, especially about um, about well, is the mind aspect that is absolutely not incorporated in these other certifications. So, and that's your area of expertise. You come from a psychology background. Yes. Um, so um, I found it really interesting. Let's just take a really quick jump into your history to talk about uh, what you were doing in with um, ch children with cancer in hospitals, and you were doing a research project around that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and just to really quickly segue, the the last two components of well that I did <laughs> mention, and and one called community, which I'll just table for now. Okay. Uh, so I, my role at IWBI is to lead the mind concept, and I, I come to IWBI with a sort of interesting background in psychology and in public health. And as you mentioned, I one of my earlier jobs was um, working in psychosocial research at a cancer hospital, and um, psychosocial research sort of looking at the aspects of when you're when you're a patient, a cancer patient, the different dimensions that can affect your psychological and social well-being. And so I was um, working with uh, a couple doctors on a research project that looked at the financial impact of um, treatment on uh, a family's well-being and, and overall just ability to thrive. And, you know, for many parents, when their child is going through treatment, it means they have to take time off of work or you have to pay for parking or you have to um, pay for food at the hospital. There's all these different things that influence your ability to, to sustain your financial well-being when you're going through that kind of experience. And it was... When I was doing that job, I thought that I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. That was sort of my original intent when I was younger and, and first emerged out of college because I had a psychology background and my whole family is in medicine. 
Um, and so sort of my model for how you help care for people is by this more individualized approach. And uh, from doing that job and then just a few other experiences, I realized that my, my true passions and my true interests lie in this more, I call it macro approach to taking care of people. And um, which is what led me into more of the public health realm. So looking well, at- Interestingly enough, your, your engagement in that study gave you a bigger picture. Yes. So you were looking at all the influencing factors and now here you are at well, and that's what you're addressing. Exactly. So it seems kind of like a natural transition, even though somebody looking at it from the outside might not have perceived it that way. Yeah. And, you know, when I think back on my journey to get to where I am now, there's lots of different influences that shaped my thinking around all this and my eventual interests. Even when I was in public health graduate school, I entered school thinking I would be doing something very different in public health. Um, my interests were different. And then I I stumbled upon this fascinating book uh, by this behavioral economist named Richard Thaler, um, and it's about nudge. It's it's I forget what the exact title is, but it's basically about these little things in our world and our society that influence people in subtle or invisible ways to shape their behavior. That's and I was cool. Completely riveted by it. I was I couldn't even <laughs> even I I'm trying to think of an example. So but while you're thinking about that, I just want to mention to everybody listening that we're going to have, Emily's going to find the title. <laughs> I'm giving you homework. And so we're going to include it um, in our links on uh, the podcast page at sustainabilitynow.global. And yeah. that way you'll be able to get a hold of this inspiring book as well. Yes, it's fascinating. I believe the book is just called Nudge. And okay. it's from Taylor and Cass Udstein, and um, they're sort of fathers of this idea about uh, this, the way in which choices are presented to us and how the, even the presentation of the choice mm -hmm. affects our biases, swings our decisions, things mm -hmm. as simple as the layout of a menu and having healthier options at the top of a menu people tend to pick a healthier option. That's the first thing they see. It's just sort of this fascinating marriage of public health and human psychology and how we interpret information and how the places and spaces and things we're presented with every day shape what we do. Um, so I read that. That opened my mind to this whole different world. Um, and then the other thing that happened was I, I went and heard a few individual speak when I was in graduate school, um, one being um, Jonathan Rose, who is a, who does work in urban development, and he was on a book tour for this book called The Well-Tempered City, which is really about how the environment, um, the environmental and economic and social challenges in cities shape human health. And again, I had never really thought about the city, a city, the physical environment, as something that directly affects your health and the health of all sorts of people. And at this, and I'll provide you the link to that. Uh, Thank you. I was just, uh, again, sustainabilitynow.global on the podcast page, you'll see it. <laughs> yes. And the other person I heard speak, um, which really sealed the deal for me being completely transfixed by this whole idea of the built environment and how it shapes your health, was I heard Mitchell Silver speak, and he is the commissioner of the New York City Parks Department. And he was talking about the public park as a public health tool and how in New York City, there's, there's a really fascinating connection, not just in New York City, but in many cities on the relationship between your proximity to a park and to green space and to nature and how it affects your mental health and your wow. physical and you would think that that would be common sense. You know, you would think we'd realize that, but how nice to have a study that actually validates that. Yes, and there is abundant research now that really just even looks at the way in which parks are designed and how they affect your health and how it impacts children and children who are exposed to natural spaces and, and green spaces when they're young can have, it, that exposure when you're young can affect your mental health even as an adult. Wow. And so I was 
I, it was one of those light bulb moments that you have in life. It was just, I remember hearing these two people speak and then reading this book and it was all within the same time period. And I had to learn more and I completely changed the course of my public health experience as a student. And um, eventually led me to finding IWBI and going down this course of, uh, of health and, and how buildings can shape your, your health and well-being. It really sounds like ID, IWBI was kind of built for you. <laughs> I mean, for you and your interests. I, well, you know, I did this after I um, went to this talk and was reading these, this book. I started doing furious Google searching and being like, where can I find some place that does this? Who mm -hmm. does this? And mm -hmm. then I found IWBI and I was like, oh, ah, <laughs> hallelujah. This is the thing. Um, awesome. And I was fortunate enough to get a job there and be able to really pursue my passions of psychology and um, finding ways in which you can support people and, and their mental well-being and their resilience and help people with really stressful situations in life or even just day-to-day -day stressors um, through this wide-scale lens of the building and how buildings operate. And the other thing that it always comes back to uh, in this kind of conversation is it's not just a building that operates, it's a culture within the building. Absolutely. And it's people within the culture. And so I'm guessing, um, and please elucidate and elaborate, um, how does mind specifically, the mind aspect of well fit into that? It fits into it. In, uh, and so, what is it? What is it actually? Yeah. So mind is one of those, one of the dimensions that we look at, as I mentioned before, air, water, movement. Mind is one of them, and that is really looking at the ways in which a building, through its, its physical design, which I can get into some strategies that we suggest in terms of the physical design component, but also through its programs, its policies, how it affects the cognitive and emotional health of people in those spaces. Um, so from in terms of programs, um, these are just examples of, of things that we recommend to our well projects. Um, a workplace offering something as simple as um, a stress management training to help people have the tools and skills to build the day-to-day -day, um, uh, strategies to improve your resiliency in the face of little stressors, even just the subway being late, or um, you know, you spill coffee down your shirt. How do you deal with that? Um, and uh, even offering things like mindfulness training, which has become really popular in recent years, um, and uh, even offering a uh, subscription to an app, uh, like a mindfulness app, and encouraging that. Um, so that's more of the, the program-oriented oriented, um, components of MIND. Uh, we also look at policies, like sort of more of the traditional HR policies that can affect your well-being, your, your mental well-being. So um, on the really fundamental level, um, at least in the U.S., how pe most people have, in, have health insurance from their employer, um, does your insurer and your employer uh, provide insurance that can cover mental health issues that, that someone may have. And, and we know that, I mean, the, the unfortunate reality is about a third of adults over the course of their lifetime will experience some sort of common mental health condition, whether it be depression or anxiety or, or something else. It's really common, um, but there's not always adequate healthcare coverage for it. And, and it might be stigmatized too. In exactly. The culture. Exactly. And, and, you know, about two thirds of people who have a common mental health condition, like depression, anxiety, really common, are working. And yeah. so it's really important to think about what a workplace is doing to support people who are, are facing those conditions, just like they would support any other physical health condition. Yeah. Um, but there's other policies that can really impact your well-being. Um, things as simple and as basic as offering sufficient paid time off and having the culture of your workplace be one that supports actually taking that paid time off and signing off when you're off. And, and this goes a little bit into the cultural element you were mentioning, Mira, that it's so important to have a culture that supports the use of these 
policies that are meant to enhance and support our well-being. So in, um, in the MIND concept, we do have a, a component that talks about something like paid time off. And one of the requirements is that our well projects show some sort of documentation or describe how leadership in an organization model uh, certain behaviors like the leadership themselves take paid time off. And when they do, they aren't answering emails. They aren't taking phone calls. As we know through really interesting research that's come out about sort of workplace dynamics and organizational psychology, that your leader and even your just your direct manager, not even the CEO of a company, really impact how other employees behave. So I, I, so I have to ask you something um, <laughs> that's just screaming in my head here is you're, you're actually part of the well certification is incorporating all these things you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So by, by becoming uh, well certified, they have to be implementing cultural changes. Like yeah. you're probably impacting the executive team um, that is then trickling down. If people are actually taking time off and modeling these behaviors, then yeah. yeah so that's, you're actually not just creating a, um, a friendly environment physically, but culturally you're, you're implementing a cultural model yes or exactly. promoting a, a cultural model then exactly and and yeah we're, we're that's really, pretty radical we're trying to be <laughs> it's <laughs> awesome well we you know we know and um I, just anecdotally from my own life and and anyone that i've talked to about well we've all been in workplaces that have cultures that ha are not great and there's things that we really are trying to encourage through, um, you know, we know that the physical design can do a lot, having good air quality, having good water quality, all of those really essential and important elements. But if you don't have a culture that's healthy, that's supportive, that's nurturing, people are not going to thrive. And ultimately, an organization won't thrive as much because you'll see people turn over, people will leave, um, there'll be more absenteeism. It's just... So I have to ask you, yeah. the companies that are going for well certification, do they already have a lot of these cultural elements in place or are they really truly being transformed in the process of their certification? I think... Some already have some of the elements, um, which makes sense. You know, it's there's already interest and buy-in from the organization itself to invest in their employees and human health. So you can sort of guess that they're going to have some um, a leg up in a way in order to just have them be interested in well in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, especially probably with our earlier adopters um, back when we first launched. Um, but what's really fascinating is we're seeing that even in, in organizations that might not have as strong of a, a, work, a health culture um, or a wellness culture, pursuing well ignites conversations about how culture can change. And even just being in a well space, um, having that certification plaque on the, on the front door, I, prompts conversation about what it means to be a, an organization that is well. And you know, the beauty of well is that uh, one, of the, one of the major challenges that faces workplace wellness and people in HR who are trying to do these culture shifts is that there's really low engagement. Mm -hmm. People don't always engage in, in their, you know, fitness reimbursements or, um, you know, the Fitbit challenges or things like that. And that's an, a, a, a consistent struggle. And um, what's fascinating about well is that it, because some of the things that we're doing are just these invisible forces that affect us every day, like light, like air that you breathe in. We all have to breathe in air, um, like drinking the water. You get 100% participation in your wellness program because it's just what we're experiencing every day. Mm -hmm. But then by virtue of that 100% participation, it's lending itself to conversations about the things that people may not have participated in in the past, because it's just creating this different thinking and sparks about how we can live in even more to the culture of being well. 
I'm kind of blown away at the possibility of change that is happening without resistance. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, the pebble in the pond and all the ripples go yeah. outward. Um, yeah. So I, I'm wondering if, just to put you on the spot a little bit, <laughs> is, is there uh, like a case study that you can just sort of give an example about a cultural shift that you witnessed mm -hmm. in working with an organization? You don't have to identify the organization or anything. I'm just... Wonder. Yeah, no, I can definitely give you an example. There's quite a few. Um, one is, and I'll identify it because they're an incredible example of the transformative power of well, um, is the American Society of Interior Designers. They were the first. Um, they're That's a great place to start. That's yeah. a great organization, Brad. We love them. They're a, a super well champion. Um, and some of it is because they've seen the really the major impact that it's had on their workplace. So they are based in uh, Washington, DC, and they are the first uh, dual well and lead platinum certified project. Mm -hmm. And they did all these amazing updates to their space. They have abundant natural light, they have circadian lighting, so lighting that changes throughout the day that um, uh, aligns with your natural circadian rhythms, so it gets a little dimmer as the day progresses on, a little brighter in the morning. Um, they did all this amazing biophilic design, so that's incorporating nature into the, the workplace, like your plants and um, other natural elements, like having even just like wood grain texture and simulated uh, patterns of nature in the space to make it feel a little more nurturing and, and human and natural. Um, and they did this amazing update to their acoustics where they, um, in their customer service area, I think they field like 5,000 calls a month, their customer service, but it's an open office. And so they did these amazing panels to sort of dim the, the noise. Um, they added sit stand desks for everyone. Anyway, they did all these incredible updates. And, uh, what they also did was they partnered with Cornell university to do pre survey and post survey to see the very cool they have on their uh, office workers and, and well requires that every, um, every project does a post occupancy survey. So after they move in, but not every, just logistically, not everyone can do the pre and the post, but what's so exciting about that. And this is my research sort of, uh, love of research. <laughs> coming out of You're geeking the, out here. <laughs> the, uh, the amazing impact that happens pre-post and how it is truly transformative. And they um, found that people were reporting just feeling healthier, their own perceived health. Um, people were feeling happier in the workplace. They were feeling more productive, more collaborative. Um, and they also saw, uh, I think, about a 25% reduction in turnover and absenteeism and maybe it wasn't 25 percent no but it, they found a 25 percent improvement in sleep people were reporting about a improvement in sleep 25 percent of their employees due to the circadian lighting wow they were attributing to that um, but what they did find also was reductions in absenteeism and turnover and sick days and sick costs and all these things that are really expensive to yep. Uh, an organization and so it's it's so exciting to hear these case studies because it makes me feel and everyone at IWBI like this is really making a difference and well you just touched something that's really an important element and and often the most important element when it comes to what drives business which I think is unfortunate but we're not even going to go there but it's the monetary aspect and your results are saying hey guess what this is not only financially feasible but is going to improve your bottom line because it's going to reduce a whole lot of these uh, peripheral costs yeah exactly. and not to mention quality of life which is lovely but and I, I don't believe that, you don't believe that, but there's still that, that, that kind of monetary foundation for driving business and oh. for driving change. Mm -hmm. And you know, that is that is just the reality of our world. For now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what we really believe in and have been trying to push is that for a business to be um, thriving financially, um, not just in terms of the people, 
But in order to thrive financially, you need to focus on your people and the planet. So, so you know, sustainability. And then that leads to profit. And yes. if you are thinking about those two elements, you're going to get the results. And this, and this is a major paradigm shift. And actually, um, I think for a good portion of our, his, our recent history, the focus was on maximizing profit and people were expendable. And I think that it's coming back around to recognizing that people are your biggest asset. And financially, it's really costly to be churning people. Not to mention what it does to a culture, not to mention not to mention the ethics of it. Exactly, and and you know it's it's really fascinating to look at trends in um, just as as demographics shift. As for example, more and more millennials are the bulk of the workforce population. There's a different sort of thinking about what the workplace should offer to you and what one gets out of the workplace. Yay, millennials. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, right? Yeah, I mean, and if it results in healthier spaces, that's great, I'm a millennial. So, I mean, I, and, and in about, I think 10 years, I've seen recent stats, about 75% of the workforce will be made up of millennials, which is people born in the early 80s, all the way to the early 2000s or something like that, which, so it makes a lot of sense. Um, but people want something different from the workplace. They want, um, to feel like they're growing, they want to feel like they're being nurtured, and that and and what work provides people these days is something different than it used to be. I think, I think it's that they want something more from life, and if they're going to spend a good portion of their life working, then that work needs to have uh, inherent value to it and reward from it, and it's not just about a paycheck. Exactly. And so. And yeah, that's pushing really positive values as far as I'm concerned. It's well overdue. Yeah, and and you know we live in a society where people are really interconnected with technology and what's demanded of office workers and employees is is in many ways different than what it used to be. You can always access people, which is a whole other problem in itself, but I think with this increased availability, with this faster pace, people feel the need to get something more out of work because you have to put a lot more of yourself into it. Um, and maybe more is demanded of you. And so if those are the expectations, people want to feel satisfied in order for it to feel worth it. Yes. And, and valued, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what I understand, I don't know what the statistics are off the top of my head, but I understand that uh, millennials will work for an organization for less money if it's a, a cause that they connect to. So it's yeah. much more principle driven. It's not money driven. And so their value shift is something that we need just as a, as a global population moving into trying to create a future that works. You know, that's not just dollar driven. Absolutely. And that's so true. I, um, I went to this great talk at the Mindful Leadership Summit, which is every fall in, in Washington, D.C. And it was the CEO of the American Sustainable Business Council. And they sort of, are they, do you know them? Um, well, I know that the, there's a sustainable business network in Philadelphia. Okay. And actually, it was founded here, which is phenomenal. Yeah, it really is really the the uh, the founding place for so many progressive things that have kind of evolved into the world. B Corps and mm -hmm. you guys and mm -hmm. and it's extraordinary, right? Yes, it really. Were you is. started was well started in Philly or New York or? Uh, New York. Okay, New York. well, close. <laughs> we'll, we'll take ownership by proximity. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I, I went to hear the CEO of the American Sustainable Business Council speak, and he was saying that what they found is um, millennials and I think the younger generations, Gen Z, people who are younger than millennials, are willing to pay more for products that align with their values that exactly. are, um, you know, a, that comes from a company that's a B Corp or that, um, you know, there's, there's these other certifications that uh, even, you know, chocolate bars have on their labels that show that they're, you know. Fair trade. 
Fair trade, exactly. Single origin, non-GMO, all the things. People will pay more. And so I think there's a similar parallel there to sort of what people want in their workplace and the willingness, yeah. as you said, um, maybe not make as much money, but really feel that satisfaction that you're contributing back to the world. Yeah. Uh, is, you know, that that is definitely contributing to the growth of well. And, and you know what, it's that, that uh, perspective and that shift that really gives me hope. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think what's, I, and there's, I'm sure there's so many reasons that this shift has happened, but some of it is we're just in a more interconnected world and people are more aware of what's going on. You can open your phone and read the news about something that's happening so far away and, and feel, hopefully feel empathy for what other people are experiencing, see the effects of climate change in other places and want to make a difference. Um, see how other people are living in countries where maybe the air quality isn't as good and want to create spaces where people can breathe good air. And my hope is that that interconnectedness, that awareness produces more empathy and drives people to want to do work that is impactful. At least that drives me. But, you know, that's my hope for the world and for my generation. That's beautiful. My hope, too. My hope yeah. too, because the only way we're going to do it is together, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And we need we need we need people to be m more aware that we are totally connected yeah. around the globe, and yeah. that we are all one family. Yes, exactly. And mm -hmm. and what we're really the long term goal of what we're all we're trying to do at IWBI is just is transform how people see buildings and the workplace and communities and how they can really be. Um, caretakers and nurture people and just the way we've seen with lead and the green building movement is once once people start doing it and more and more people start doing it and then it just becomes integrated into best practice and then it's like oh you wouldn't do you wouldn't think about sustainability when you're building a new building like now people everyone does that you have to and so our hope is that it we also have that same success and yield a, a transformation it would be lovely. I mean, I know our podcast is called Sustainability Now, but it would be lovely to make the word sustainability be antiquated and unnecessary mm -hmm. because it's just the baseline. Yes, I completely agree. Yeah, that would be great. So um, I have some notes here. I'm checking to make sure I'm covering all our great <laughs> topics. Um, okay. I'm wondering... How about roadblocks? Maybe biggest challenges in workplace health that you guys mm -hmm. encounter, and uh, and probably especially related to mental well-being. And I'm going to add to that: is there any particular practice or recommendation around internet and social media and that kind of thing? Because that's a really big cultural influence right now. Yes. Yes. Oh, I have so many thoughts on that. Uh, <laughs> So the first thing, well, I mentioned before is engagement. So it, just engagement in programs, such a big challenge. And, and one that, as I was saying before, we're hoping through um, the way in which well encourages, as I said, 100% participation and sparks conversations will support higher engagement in just workplace wellness in general. Uh, the other challenge that I've really seen a lot in my work specifically in mind is just this sort of hesitancy or discomfort around talking about mental health, mental well-being, and that it's still a, a topic in within the health realm that is, I don't want to say taboo, just that it just prompts a little uh, discomfort or people aren't really sure how to talk about it. And it is, it, it, there is a stigma still attached. Yes. And there's a, because I think there's such a deep vulnerability yeah. when you go into that area. Everybody's supposed to be, no, no, I'm fine. I'm good. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And everyone, you know, puts on their armor and wants to, does, people don't want to share their cards and be vulnerable. What has been really um, encouraging, I'd say, is with the rise in the mindfulness movement and that becoming really normalized, just pra practicing mindfulness, the growth of apps, Headspace, Calm, all these wonderful apps that... Oh, that's great. Actually, why don't you tell us those again, too? So Headspace. Yeah. Headspace, I'm a personal user of Headspace and love what they have. But there's others. There's Calm, Insight, Timer. I can give you a whole list. There's, a one, there's many wonderful apps that are 
that are really democratizing access to mindfulness and making it simple and accessible. And the interesting thing about it is that even just starting a conversation about having a mindfulness program is in a way starting a conversation about mental well-being and resiliency because a lot of the benefits of mindfulness and I've been a long-term practitioner myself of mindfulness in terms of just you know meditation but also yoga and mindful movement is its impact on your stress on your ability to tolerate tricky things that are happening in life the day-to-day the subway being late as I mentioned before just the little things that can trigger you to react and be stressed yeah. um, and I think the beauty of all of this, the normalization of mindfulness is that it's causing people to talk more about stress in the workplace. How can we support people? How can we support people every day and be more proactive, less reactive in terms of just setting people up to feel successful, feel healthy, feel happy and nurtured and cared for. So and that's probably propagating policy shifts too. Yeah, it is. And, and I've just, you know, I, I read about the, about workplace wellness, workplace mental health all every day, all the time. And it's been really exciting to see more and more come out about this topic. So I'm thinking, I think there's just a cultural shift that's going on where people are recognizing that it's really a problem. It's a growing problem among younger generation, um, which lends itself to our technology, your technology question. Um, and that something needs to be done about it because it's not an issue that's going away. In terms of technology and healthy relationships, I have my own uh, feelings about that because I don't I don't use Instagram or social media. I don't have them on my phone because I have I I experimented last year with deleting them off my phone. Oh wow! Well, before vacation, I was like, I'm gonna really go off the grid. See, uh, I was I was also camping in Iceland, and so I didn't even have my my phone really. I didn't have Wi-Fi or anything, but I just figured, you know, just in case I have Wi-Fi. I'm going to attempt myself, get rid of the apps. And then I so loved having them deleted that I just stuck with it. And so um, personally, I think just limiting temptation, I've sort of like built environment in my phone in that like I've <laughs> created an environment that um, is a little more nurturing to me. But I think the other thing is, um, you know, limiting... <sighs> limiting notifications, limiting use, and just trying to prompt awareness. I mean, I, I will say to the credit of the Apple and the people who are creating these smartphones, they are trying to address this more by just, you know, creating more awareness. And um, they have systems now where in, that you can, in your phone, it can tell you how much you use your screen, how much you use certain apps. So I think the shift that I'm seeing now is just tech companies and people who produce this that the phones and whatnot are just trying to create more awareness. Um, it's challenging. I mean, the apps and everything, I keep motioning to my phone. It's right over here. <laughs> um, it's like never outside of arm's reach. Um, it's true. <laughs> it's true. I sleep with my phone next to my bed, so it's within arm's reach. I can talk to it and say, hey, what time is it? Did I mean, you? just, it's it's ridiculous. I know. You know what I did? It's like seemingly now revolutionary as I got an alarm clock. And so <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I actually got one of those wonderful alarm clocks that has the light that um, starts, em it starts emitting light uh, before you wake up. It's really great. Um, okay. I recommend those, but because um, it sort of eases you into waking up. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tricky, the technology question. And um, I struggle with myself as being on my email late at night. There, there, I will say there is a great, um, there's a great add on you can do to your computer to, uh, reduce the light, the blue light. I think. Yes. Do you use that? I, yeah. I, I, I have it and <clears throat> I, I know it changes. It, it becomes like a, a orangey, uh, yep. color in the evening. Mm -hmm. I don't like that. I, I often, like if I'm still working, I tend to turn it off. I just find it uh, not enjoyable. Yes. Well, that's fair. And you definitely shouldn't do online shopping when you, uh, when no. you <laughs> the colors are <laughs> that error. <laughs> and you, you know, I have an art background, so I'm always design oriented and that color yeah. it has a big impact on me. And it's just when everything is off like that. That's if fair. it were rose color, maybe rose colored glasses, I might enjoy that better, but 
<laughs> no, that's fair. But then it, it does, I personally have found that it has helped just with when I'm up later at night doing work or on my computer that it doesn't, it's easier for me to fall asleep. But yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, it'll be interesting, and I'm really fascinated because this is a topic that I just, I'm completely riveted by, is sort of the, the way in which technology shapes our mental well-being and how it transform, has transformed society yeah. um, and transformed our culture. So we'll see. Uh, I It feels like it's an ever-evolving topic. There's more and more research coming out, it seems like, every day about the effect of technology on kids, on teenagers, on everybody. So. Yeah. We'll see, and and it's something we haven't really sufficiently tackled in in well, but never say never. It's evolving. It's right? evolving. It's evolving. So I, yeah. I'm sorry. I have to ask you: How can people get involved with well? Support what you guys are up to. Mm -hmm. What kind of steps? Yeah. Um, you can first of all, if you want to learn more about well, uh, we have a website, of course. And we're gonna we're gonna have links to all all of these links we'll have on the website. But I just want you to say to people, you know, how they can pursue it too. Yes. Um, well, the first thing is um, if you go to our website and we have our um, we have resources with articles and whatnot and. Uh, we'll say the say the URL too. Oh, wellcertified.com. Thank and you. <laughs> from there, you can access our our whole standard, the well standard. We it's um, there's no paywall. Anyone can access it. That was really important to us as an organization to make all of this um, information about healthy buildings, about healthy cultures available. Because even if you don't want to pursue certification, we're basically providing a toolbox that can help someone do that in their organization. And, and I think the thing that's also important for people to know is that all of this is very deeply founded in research. Yes. So you have answers to things that people didn't even know to ask the question about yet. Yeah. And the well building certification, the well certification is really comprehensive. Yes. And very, very deep. So it's worth checking out. We'll have links to that too. Yes. And all of our citations are also available. So if someone really wants to deep dive, you can look into every single citation that we, we cite um, for across the whole standard and look into the research that we're looking into. So we've tried. Transparency is really important and to us and and as well as research and also just knowledge sharing and so we want to make this really available as i mentioned before we're trying to change start a movement change the way people think about these things and there's you know if it's all hidden can't do that um, so if you had a if you had a logo for the, or a, a tagline for the movement what's the movement name what's the tagline oh gosh our marketing team probably wouldn't want me to make one up on the spot. Well, the, okay, so this is just, a, a, we'll say a summary of, yes. what, of what it would be. Yes, um, that healthy buildings are for everyone and that uh, everyone deserves to be in a place that makes them feel good. That can Healthy buildings, healthy people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's really the the end goal of all of this is just to to give everyone access to a healthy place to be. Um, the other way to get involved, if people want to get involved, so we do have a um, a professional certificate uh, accreditation called the Well AP Well Accredited Professional, um, and it means you you take an exam and it um, gives you access to a really wonderful community of people who are also advocates of healthy building and place wellness. Um, it's about 7,000 people in almost 70 countries now who are well APs. Yeah. And um, it really opens up a door to just continued education, networking, the latest tools and resources. Uh, it's a really active community. And I would really recommend being involved with that um, if you want to learn more and become a part of this whole movement. We also have a newsletter that we send out every month and, and we can include links to that too at the bottom, just how to sign up. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, those are probably the best ways to be involved. Wonderful. And, yeah. So Emily, I always ask, what should I have asked that I didn't? Is there anything I should, I missed? Uh, hmm. Really the, you know, what we were just talking about is just sort of what is the, the one summary uh, or the one final takeaway is that it's our goal is to make this for everyone and our mission is 
to address the health concerns that affect every corner of the world. I mean, we're based in New York City, but we're a global organization and our goal is to ever evolve well to reflect local realities in in other parts of the world um, and make our program equitable and inclusive and available to all. And that's so important to me, to everyone at IWPI, and, and that's our eventual goal. That's our current goal and long-term goal. That's beautiful. Yes, thank you, Emily, so much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. This is great. So um, that's it for now. I, have, I just want to thank you, our listeners, for being here. Please share the podcast, sh- uh, rate it, you know, give us comments. We really want to hear from you. And until next time, live your best life. Love the world around you, and together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now, solutions to shape a world that works. Visit sustainabilitynow.global for resources related to today's program. And be sure to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.